we've uh, we've got a bunch of things we were going to cover tonight, um, particularly Guardians of the Galaxy Three. Not everyone in the panel has seen it, however, so I think it makes more sense to talk about um, some of the other things in our lineup, uh, principally. Peter Pan and Wendy, or Wendy and Peter Pan, as the case may be. Uh, it came out, I believe, this week, and got absolutely savaged <laughs> once it came out. I'm just, uh, no way. if you bear with me <laughs> one second, I'm going to check the uh, the Rotten Tomatoes score um, and see what it's sitting at, because it wasn't looking too good last time I checked. But, uh, all right, Peter Pan and Wendy, it's... Yeah, it's pretty small. The, <laughs> so amongst the critics, uh, who we all deeply respect, it's sitting at 65%. The audience score, with more than 2,500 ratings, is 15%. Oh, oh. yeah. That is a brutal score. Um, but for the people that have seen it, and I know a few people on the panel here have, uh, I think it's probably quite well deserved, I would say. It wasn't a great movie, was it? Mm. It wasn't. I'm slightly oh, conflicted on that one, though. Um, I don't think it was as bad as 15% or whatever that score is. I think it was awful, but I can think of a lot of things that I would give 15% more than this. The problem with this wasn't that it was sort of like comically bad in the way that so much modern Marvel stuff is. The problem with this is that you've taken Peter Pan, which is this sort of timeless, magical story, and you've produced this grey, soulless, unimaginative, slightly yeah. self-contradicting thing, which the writers clearly didn't understand themselves. And you've somehow turned Peter Pan into a villain without even realising it, which is quite well done. I think, yes. uh, yeah, I was going to talk about that, actually. But yeah, I think whenever it's a beloved property that you've basically uh, bastardised and ruined, uh, there's always going to be that extra level of venom amongst the audience um, and, a, a, and a desire to vote it down. And I think it takes that box, you know, you've taken a, a children's classic story that's been around for, what, well over 100 years now. Yeah, 120 uh, and, years. Yeah, and you've produced a, a modern version of it um, with all the, the garbage that comes along with that. And it, it just brings about that extra layer of anger amongst uh, fans, I suppose, and audiences. And it's probably that which is driving this. But uh, yeah, when you're talking about the, the the sort of villainous nature of Peter Pan, like yeah, there's there's quite a lot to talk about in this. I'm going to say Wendy as well is kind of horrible as a character. Um, the very yeah, first time it you was see quite her, appropriate. That's what I was going to yeah. say. The first line is she being a completely just so insolent with her mom, and it's like the first thing she's like giving her attitude, like yeah, mom, I heard you the first time. It, it's an interesting context. Like the first time you meet her, she's uh... oh no her age so she beats their asses and then hits one of them like hits their sword so hard that it flies out of his hand and smashes a mirror because she's just determined to win and then when their parents come in instead of being like the the slightly like self-sacrificial heroic character that you might think where she would say it was all my fault i'm really sorry she's just straight up like yeah it was his fault blame him <laughs> like completely throws her brothers under the bus and uh afterwards when one of them tries to call her out on it and say like why why did you blame us for that she's just like well you wanted to play as pirates didn't you it's every man for himself and i just thought great that's a hero i can root for <laughs> and <laughs> then it's awful. and then that character trait is never referenced again so i didn't even understand why they needed to put that in there because it's not like she behaves like that ever again or learns from it or grows from it it's just never mentioned again well, that, that was the problem with it because I went back, I'm doing the v video on this at the moment, well, fighting copyright, the video has been done for like two days, but still not up. Oh. Um, but I, I just put it on just out of morbid curiosity. And then I found myself thinking, how the hell have they ruined it like this? So I went back and I, I watched the 53 version. I watched the 2003 version and I read, mm. I think half of Barry's novelization as well, just to sort of understand the difference in character set up and and that's one of the many important ones that they've missed out so like the 53 animated film does this really well um the realization that she has in sort of the second third of the film is that she is already a little bit too old for all of this and she's already been shown in her first scene being kind of motherly to her brothers and so the payoff isn't this sort of pivot moment where she thinks neverland is great oh no it's horrible i want to go home it's no neverland is great but i am also ready to be a bit more than this and so the payoff at the end of it is this weird little but quite charming marriage when her, like her dad goes to the window and says you know i think i've seen that that pirate ship before and it's this middle ground between the desire to grow up 
um, but also the memory of childhood, and you shouldn't be doing too much of one too quickly. But this film just junks all of that. There's no actual setup. Like you say, she begins as this all-action, bombastic, sword-wielding, normal, boring superhero girl. And that's kind of how she is throughout until she decides just for some reason she's changed her mind and she wants to go home instead, which is not quite so fulfilling a, a story as the original, I don't think. I think what they're trying to do as well is it's weird uh, how they frame this in the story, but they obviously want to get that feminist message in there that she, um, you know, she wants to build <laughs> adventure and, and, and action and stuff like that. But her her setup at the beginning of the story is that she's going to go off to college, isn't she? She's she's going to go off to get an education and stuff, and she she's not quite ready for it. Or she doesn't want to do that because she wants to rebel against her parents. But simultaneously, they they want to have her as this like feminist icon who wants to like break free of like the uh, constraints of Victorian expectations of girls. Um, and I just thought to myself, that's exactly what they're trying to give her. They're trying to send her to school to get her an education where she could <laughs> then get a job and and have like some kind of you know fulfilling career, like be able to do more for herself. So it's almost like she sacrifices her own uh, goals in pursuit of like trying to be this this rebellious feminist, but it's like they're trying to fucking help you, you idiot! <laughs> like it's so <laughs> weird. I feel like in your little summary that you forget to mention what revolutionary technology she invented. I've been getting used to that at this point. So yeah, Did yeah. You skip that uh, part I'm, on this one. The, well, she. <laughs> it's. I'm skipping ahead here, but you get to see like a little glimpse of her future life because it's like, in order to fly in Neverland, you have to think happy thoughts. That's what like allows you to, you know, um, to to fly and 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 uh, break free of all your constraints. So her happy thoughts are her future life, and it's all being a single career woman. <laughs> it's I kid you not. It's like uh, graduating from school. Uh, becoming a writer and then fucking dying alone in her house as an old lady. Well, she becomes oh. an aeroplane pilot at one point. Oh, yeah, as well, flying, which, a, flying, flying an aeroplane. aeroplane. Which is famously Victorian women did that all the time, so it's a real aspiration <laughs> for her. It is, it is bizarre. It, I've, you know, we've we've said this before, like where you often see just the, the hang ups and the angst of the this thing just intruding into the story. I mean, She Hulk was just basically. Uh, you know, a, a sort of 30 something singleton millennial woman um, idea of like female empowerment. And that this is just yeah. a similar idea where it's very much a 21st century view uh, of what you should do with your life. And none of it revolves around uh, being a parent, having a family, mm -hmm. like raising the next generation, like dying fulfilled because, you know, you've brought like all these other people into the world. Um, which is funny because it's one of the pivotal aspects of Wendy as a character, her maternal mm -hmm. nature. Uh, in the books, <laughs> here it's completely absent. So. There's a good little scene comparison yeah. you can do that you can play. That there's the moment in the 53 film where um, she tells the brothers that they're going home tomorrow. And they say, no, we, we want to stay. And she says, no, but you need to go home. You need a mother. And then she explains to them what a mother is. And she says, you know, mother is, is this beautiful, wonderful person. She sings you to sleep. She tells you bedtime stories. She, you know, she wipes the dead off your knees and all the rest of that. She's a brilliant person. 2023 mm. has the same scene. And her line is, I'm not your mother. I don't even know if I want to be a mother. And on we go. Yeah. So it's like yeah. you, you have missed a fundamental part of what made Wendy a character and more important than the boys. The, the thing I think the writers missed in attempting to center Wendy as this sort of feminist icon is that the original was always about the girls. The girls come to the fore in the original mm -hmm. all the time. They're more intelligent than the boys. They're more mature at the same age than the boys. They drive the story along. They're the people we see through. They're the people we grow through. And they're the people that we embody as opposed to idolize. And she idolizes Peter, but Peter's no more really than just this representation of an unreachable ideal, this ideal for mm. eternal youth. And she mm. sees through that. She sees that. She thinks it's incredibly charming to begin with. There's an unrequited romance, which this film just completely ditches for the sake of nothing, amongst three different characters, which is very pivotal to the original plot and not at all in this one. Um, so you have the girl's perspective all the way through, and the girl is the one who grows, and then she's the one who's held up to be the moral icon of the story. And this one, in a bit to just make her this sword fighting heroine has just reduced that entirely it's kind of depressing i, I think part, I said partly as well it would have come across as super creepy if they tried to have like a romance between her and peter because i swear there must be like a five or six year age gap between them he yeah. looks like a small boy whereas she's like she must be like a good several inches taller than him you know yeah, like she, she looks like so much older him. than he is 
and it's just like yeah. that would that would look really weird <laughs> if they tried to get it yeah, on. But but then the, there are tactful ways they can do that, and the, and again they did do that in, in Barry's version and the fifty three film, and I think the two thousand and three film as well. Um, there's the bit where she she's obviously clearly quite attracted to him, and she wants to give him a kiss, but she feels like she can't mm. for various different reasons, and so she gives him a thimble instead as this representation of something you know she kind of wants to do it, but she knows that it would be irresponsible to do that. So you have quite a, a touching sort of young romance story but you know before it becomes anything more lurid than that um and it, it plays out really nicely and there's a bit of a payoff later on when peter gives her another little token back he still doesn't really understand what it means but he does vaguely associate it with mm -hmm. with this kind of attachment um and all of that's missing as well he, she does give him a thimble but that's not as an excuse for a kiss that's because she doesn't want to kiss him in this one because romance is not allowed in this film right and you know in that original play the one of the last lines talks about how he Peter Pan refuses to be touched by Wendy. She wants to just touch him, but he knows that that would that would change everything because it would make him have to acknowledge that he needs to be this real person and grow up and and actually acknowledge that he needs to be in the real world. So he doesn't even let her do that. And that's the whole point is that the love of a real woman, which Tinkerbell is not a real woman, she's just this fantasy. The real of a love, real woman would actually change him and make it, force him to grow up. So he turns away from that. Yeah, um, and you know, if, if you go, John Barry wrote, a, sorry, James Barry wrote um, a, an epilogue as well uh, after the fact, which sort of covers what happens once the story's ended. Um, and Peter has disappeared for for many years, and he comes back to him. It's only a day because he doesn't really give a damn about the people he made friends with. To Wendy, it's been years. She's married. She's grown up. She's got a kid. She's kind of bitter and sad that he forgot about her. He's bitter and sad that she moved on and grew up. Um, but it also it's also revealed that he forgot everything about Captain Hook. He forgot everything about Tinkerbell. He forgot everything he'd ever done and everything he'd ever known because pivotal to his nature and his character is that being an eternal child means you never form memories and so you never form real attachments and so you can never be a fully rounded human being it's a tragic tale whereas this one just has him I, I, what actually even happens he almost grows in this one there's a great moment when um captain hook falls into the water because he has no happy memories and it's all peter's fault and you think okay Peter's clearly really sad. He's going to learn something from this. And by the laws of the universe, this changes Neverland and he grows up. He's in the middle of that. And Wendy taps him on the shoulder and says, I'm bored now and I want to go home. So, <laughs> well done. <laughs> Can't have him thinking too much, you know. I have a question uh, about uh, the, the film. Uh, it's the same question that kind of looms over all of these remakes. Do you think that this film benefits or in any way justifies its existence through being a live action film compared to the original animated film? No. Not in the slightest. It's awful. Well, it's, like the filmmaking it's, it's... itself is not very interesting. I mean, like the. Not at all. The, yeah. In, in terms of like the cinema. just looks so, so terrible. She's like so terribly animated. She's not even. She doesn't even give off the light that she's supposed to give off. She's just like so dark. And then yet there's like a light source everywhere. You're not even sure why. There's a theory to this, like, I'll, I'll talk about different aspects of it, like, uh, in terms of the Tinkerbell thing, I, I think, and I could be wrong, but I think if they tried to make her glow like they did in the animated movie, it would kind of undo the fact that she's played by a black actress, and so <laughs> and they couldn't do it. Yeah. <laughs> so they, they had to keep her like that. Some way they could have at least yeah, they, chocolate her or they, something. Something she could have had some halo or something. But yeah, the, the result is she yeah. just looks really dull and and kind of like washed out. And she's quite often shown in darkness as well. So she kind of blends into the background. She's just not very interesting. In fact, there's more I can say about her character because um, they do away with the fundamental aspect of of her character arc from the original movie. Mm -hmm. um, the general cinematography is just it, it's like a discount pirates of the caribbean i think that's the best way i could describe it you know the the, the cgi looks dog shit um you know it seems the, like uh the live action films are becoming a, a lot more assembly line the longer that they mm -hmm. go on in the same way that the marvel filmmaking has kind of deteriorated in their desire to like make sure that they're consistently delivering these types of films because the, of <sighs> obviously like disney sort of objectives as a business of like having you know their films on disney plus or release theatrically that they've just got to keep pumping them out like year after year yeah there, there's definitely there's some good shots where like the galleon like lifts up into the air and it turns over and stuff and it's kind of all right um there's other scenes where they're flying over neverland or over london and it just looks awful um but you can tell this movie was done on a bit of a budget right. it doesn't doesn't look great 
I was curious to ask all of you, especially because I haven't seen it, is they have at least one actor in this film, right? Jude Law? How is he mm-hmm. as Hook? Was, He's uh, good. Hmm. I mean, he was good. It, 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 it's, yeah, it's the classic thing of, of a good actor with a crappy script, I think. Mm. You know, because they completely change Hook's backstory. You know, in the, in the original, he was just an evil pirate guy. It's like, fine. He, he absolutely relishes being evil and he fucking loves it. And it's, it's good. You know, he's theatrical. He's over the top. He's grandiose. Uh, here, they, they change his backstory so that he was once a lost boy himself. He was actually the first time. He was Peter's best friend. But he missed his mother. And so he went off, uh, left Nether- Neverland, sorry, in search of her. And um, got lost at sea. And he was adopted by the pirates. They raised him. They made him one of their own. And he eventually rose to to command them. Um, so a nice story, you know. He found his own hmm. family. But then he returned to Neverland uh, <laughs> to to reunite with Peter. Peter couldn't accept the fact that he was grown up now, and so he cut his fucking hand off and fed it to a crocodile. Like what? he mutilated a man and fed it to an animal. This guy's an absolute psychopath. Uh, <laughs> you know, and this is the thing. Like that happens in the that original guy. story, but it was. It, not justified, but it's, it's, it can be explained by the fact that Captain Hook was an evil guy who just wanted to kill Peter, but now it's like he's this sympathetic villain who's actually got a tragic backstory, and Peter is just this merciless psycho who mutilates him and feeds bits of him to animals. Like yeah, there's, there's that moment kind of late on when that they're fighting on top of the pirate ship and, and Hook goes to fall off. Peter grabs him and tries to teach him how to fly again and says, think happy thoughts, and Hook just stares at him and says, Peter, I haven't got any. <laughs> and it's your fault is the implication you took yes. him from him. You left him like this, but no consequences. This is the, the the problem when you have to go and give backstories to everything is that you do invite loads of questions, moral questions and emotional questions that you don't need to. But if you are going to do that, you have to answer those questions. And this film well, does the variables of uh, adaptation, right? Like when you introduce new elements, you can't necessarily look at what the original story had and just pull straight from that and then be fine, right? Like there's extra work that you may need to do depending on the choices yes. that you make. Mm-hmm. The yeah. the there's no is the laziest really yeah the laziest way to do an adaptation right is to say I'm going to tie together all these things that weren't actually related in the original story so it's all connected that's the lazy way to do something like this because it's like it seems superficially smart you know so instead of like Hook just being an evil pirate guy who wants to kill Peter now it's like oh he's actually got this deep history with him he used lost boy himself, and that adds an extra layer of pathos to his character. But you don't stop to think about the long-term implications of that, like, story-wise. It even echoes through into the actual main plotline. Like, for example, he's searching for Peter's hideout, okay? And it's only Wendy singing, like, a lullaby to the the kids that, like, uh, clues him into where they're at. But it's like, you were a lost boy yourself. You should fucking know where Peter Pan's hideout is. Your name is literally written on the door in this place. you were there, don't you remember? (laughs) Like... Yes. It's it's like, uh, a lot of these films can run into that problem because it's almost like as part of justifying their existence they need to be because a lot of these films are pretty short um like a lot of the older disney animated films right. are pretty short most of them are less than 90 minutes usually these ones end up being closer to two hours i think it was found out that like the new little mermaid is going to be like 40 50 minutes longer than the original it's like well that's yeah. that's time you got to fill with new material <laughs> And how congruent that material is with whatever you're pulling from the uh, the original, you know, like it, yeah, it can cause problems. This is the it's strange a- thing about this one as well, which is that it is almost twice as long as the original, and yet they abridge most of the key plot points from the original, so there's less uh, content huh. in that. Um, and they somehow don't fill the time with anything. So the, the, the 53 version is very efficient. There's always like two, always a minimum of two plot things going on at once. So when one stops, you go to the other one. Um, with this film, they, they get to the end of a significant beat and then there's nothing. And it's an excuse for people just to walk around and occasionally one of the characters will tell Wendy how brilliant she is. And then we move on again, but nothing substantive happens. Me- in the meantime, what the biggest plot change that I think they made is that um, obviously in the original Tinkerbell, very jealous of Wendy, tries to betray Wendy. She goes, she gets captured by Hook, she gives the location away, and that puts Peter Pan in mortal peril. None of that happens in this, so Tinkerbell isn't really a character. She has no moral agency. Instead, Captain Hook just shoots the kids down when they arrive and they have to go and rescue the brothers. But there's no replacement for the Tinkerbell arc in this, so there's no actual character strife that forms. All of the female characters love each other as opposed to being jealous of each other, so they don't really form off of each other. Um, and it just becomes this long, drawn-out, empty thing with no characters and minimal story compared to a much shorter film with much more story, which did everything better. 